Let's go ahead and get started. So thank you all for coming to today's lunchtime talk in science and mathematics. It's the last one for the semester. Um, watch for the next semester schedule sometime early next semester. So middle of January, I should have that out. Um, but with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rob Benson, implementation of, a G of GIS in a campus setting, and brought others with him. So help you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, the best thing about this talk, though, is I get to spread the blame. Because there are a lot of people involved in this one, uh, although I'll take, I'll take most of the responsibility for it. So uh, it's not just me this time, thank goodness. Uh, so I'll be spending a little bit of time. Get pizza. It's very important. <laughs> uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about what this thing called GIS is in terms of how we've uh, started to implement it here on campus. Uh, like all good projects, this is one that is continuing and it's not done with by any means, but we're getting a good start on things. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why we are doing this stuff. Okay, this is important stuff. It has to do, has to do with a you know, sense of place. Uh, and this isn't just, you know, a sense of place like we happen to be you know, in Alamosa or happens to be a cold place or anything like that. Uh, this is really important stuff because when you talk about this idea of location, location, et cetera, it's not just some slogan that business guys use about where they want to put the donut shop. It's really, really very important because this is all about decision making. Now, when it comes to place and decisions, uh, what's the decision that we have to make about fishing? <laughs> Yeah, that's a long story, right? That's a very important decision that we have to make. Uh, place is really important, even if it's you know, not you know, having to do with uh, you know, where you don't want to go. Uh, so you're making good decisions and so forth, hopefully. But the key thing here, and this is how it ties into our campus scenario, is how do we use resources effectively? Because we don't have unlimited resources. Now, when I talk about resources, am I talking about natural gas? Am I talking about money? Am I talking about people? The answer is yes. All those things are considered to be resources. So as far as ASU goes, the idea of using GIS here is just without question. I mean, 20 years ago, we might have argued it. Now we don't. It's just unquestionable. How many people in here have cell phones? Actually, maybe the better question is how many people don't have cell phones? Uh, and chances are pretty good that you have some sort of enabling location type software on them. And you all run up your data plan by figuring out where you are, right? Uh, that's all GIS stuff, believe it or not. And so now the question is, how do we use it here? Well, the immediate needs are, like, where are we when it comes to things like this. Where do you dig a hole in the ground? Where do you not dig a hole is perhaps more important. Now, believe it or not, you know those little banners that are all around campus? Those had to be very carefully located. Now, think about that. It's just a banner, right? It waves in the wind and it's cool and it does all kinds of cool stuff. You just go up there and just plant it in the ground, don't you? Yes. yes. And do any problems ever occur because you're just planting it in the ground? Uh, yes. So, that's, again, these are some of the immediate needs. Here's another one. Do we ever have problems on campus? No. <laughs> never, never, right? But we, we're all good at finding problems. How good are we at fixing them? Okay, when it comes to infrastructure, like sprinklers and everything else, and you find the fountain of youth going next to your office, uh, who do you call? It's not Ghostbusters. <laughs> it's, uh, these fine folks. Uh, and so there's a question there. How do you fix it? What's the most effective way to fix it? Here's one that's a little more serious. If there's a real emergency going on, what do you do about it? Now, one happened yesterday, which all got announced to us. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't an emergency, but it could have been. The Bridges and Hall elevator. What if somebody had been stuck, not on the third floor, not on the second floor or the first floor, but somewhere between the second and third floor? That's yeah, that's what it, yeah, it's, it's a little, you know, it's questions like that. So here's something that's even a bigger picture beyond everyday kinds of things. I mean, infrastructure is expensive. 
Ask anybody who's built a house or added onto a house. Has anybody ever put in lawn sprinklers and those kinds of things? It involves expensive uh, stuff. So the key words here are effective, plan, and optimize. This is important. <coughs> GIS allows you some tools. Any questions? This is oops, isn't it? This is oops, isn't it? This is another oops. Now, this one doesn't look nearly as dangerous as the other guys. I mean, this one is bad news. It's a gas line uh, demonstrating that it's indeed gas and flammable. This is a water main saying, yeah, let's wash out the streets because some yahoo hit me with a backhoe. And then this one, there are a whole lot of people you don't even see in the picture who are saying, what happened to my data connection? How come I can't spend money on Amazon? It's because your dollars are going into this thing and falling into the hole. They're not getting to Amazon. Uh, so again, this is the kind of stuff that we have to think about. So back to ASU. We all know what ASU stands for. Do we all know what GIS stands for? Sort of, kind of. Some people have suffered through some classes with me and know what it is. Uh, it's geographic information systems. It's basically intelligent maps. What's the why and the where and so forth? We here in the Earth Sciences program have been doing this for a long time, and we've been using ESRI products. Everybody, all know, everybody knows what ESRI stands for, right? I didn't think so. Environmental Systems Research Institute. It started in 1967 at this little place in Massachusetts called MIT, another abbreviation. Uh, so we've been involved in doing GIS instruction. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of stuff with mapping and so forth. And there are three people in here who have been using GIS mapping recently, right? Uh, with regards to you know, archaeology, geomorphology, and a variety of different sorts of things. We've also started doing a little bit more recently with this idea of outreach. And the idea of outreach has been kind of getting th thrown at us for a little while. And it's great. You guys do it in the sciences. Isn't that cool? What about everybody else who can use this stuff? And so that's why we've been looking at getting this going on campus in a useful sort of a way. Uh, and then we've been using the facilities folks. I don't want to say guinea pigs, because you've willingly have jumped into this program. And so the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is the kind of stuff that people usually think of when they think about GIS. And that's the desktop environment. That's where you sit at the comfort of your desk with your coffee, and you look at a screen. And you think, wow, that's pretty cool. This is really amazing stuff. I think I'll go have some more coffee. Uh, I don't care if it's snowing outside. Is that particularly helpful when it comes to the immediate needs kind of a thing, or planning, or anything like that necessarily? Uh, no, it doesn't. This is an example of uh, some mine land work uh, that's been done up north of here, and there are all kinds of, you know, different bits of information in this. There are different layers here in the GIS system. This is the typical desk stop, desktop stuff. So, great. That's the desktop environment, but how do you use it, what do you use it for, and so forth. You just don't, like, start throwing things into it and hope that garbage does not come out. So we had to do a little bit of planning here, and we initially started this implementation working with facilities and computing services. Uh, those guys are wonderful to work with. And the first priority that they came up with was not, let's just do everything all at once, but what's underground? And again, that gets back to the where do you dig thing? Where do you avoid cutting the fiber optic? How do you avoid hitting the sewer line? Uh, and those sorts of things. So, there's certainly room for expansion up to more surface-like things, and folks have been looking at that as well. But this is really, really key. Long-term data accessibility. How can we rephrase that to one word? It's kind of a think about it question. Retirement. There are a lot of people on campus who know everything really well here. What if they retire? What happens to that big bank of information? Uh, so, you know, we're trying to get that going a little bit more and get all that, that, get that brain trust 
uh, in the ground, uh, not literally, but so we can use it. Uh, and then this thing's important as well. Connecting the office to the field. So imagine somebody who gets a call, all right? Hey, I have a problem out in the field wherever. Can they figure out where things are? Can they provide information back to people? Can they send someone out? They probably can. So we're going to get to some actual specific examples of all these things, but some of the needs that are identified, um, or the first step in getting these needs identified, was to you know, talk to people, come up with some ideas. Now, this is very important on the second bullet. There are two things here. This whole GIS program that I'm talking about today is not something that I came up with. It's not something that any individual came up with. This is a team effort. The stakeholders are the guys out doing the work. The supervisors are the ones that have to get the resources for the guys to do their work. This is a big integrated sort of a process. It spans a whole range from, hey, we have a problem right now, to long-term planning kinds of things. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those in the needs area that we got into. The design has got to be adaptable. Is it possible to design everything from the ground up to work perfectly the first time every time? No, it's not. So the beauty of this system that has kind of come together uh, is that if you guys come up with ideas, it can be changed to better suit it to what you need to do. Now, everybody sees opportunity here, the doors to go through. Is it always easy to do? For you guys who have taken GIS, did it always go really smoothly? Was there a lot of head bashing, gnashing of teeth? Yes. Is there still head bashing and gnashing of teeth going on? But at the same time, you can kind of play through the pain and get a good result out and get something happening. Uh, so the actual data side of things, you know, what, what are we going to collect? What are the important things? And I didn't, I didn't ask the question in the sense of, hey, we're going to go out and do these things. I asked the facilities guys and the telecom guys and the computing services guys, rather, you know, what do, they, what do they want? What do they see? What are the needs that they have to have? One of them is electrical. There's a lot of electrical stuff underground. What else is underground? There's stuff called water. And it's not just water, it's gas. All right, are you starting this? I mean, those three things sound bad enough, don't they? Like, let's not just trench the whole campus. Well, what's the highest voltage electrical line coming into this place? Anybody know? That's a lot of juice. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's enough to make a pretty good thunderstorm in your uh, backhoe, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, and of course, the water and the gas are all very important too, but I mean, each one of these has some details to it. And we'll talk a little bit more about what they're doing in the field. Uh, but building details, okay, walk up to a building. Okay, well, how do you get into the building with the utilities? How can you, you know, map out different kinds of things? What kind of information can you find out about that building? The building details one is kind of in the future. Parking lots is one that has been proposed. Uh, you know, think of a parking lot out there. Okay, what, what kind of information do we need to know about a parking lot? Where to drain it? Where to drain it's one. What's another one? Spaces. How many spaces are there? And is it just spaces? But what about the spaces? Permits, Permits handicapped, you know, all those kinds of things. Different and when do you, when do you repave it? what's the age? of that. See, there's all kinds of information you can start run, running into this. And then from a geographic information systems point of view, a parking lot is simply an area. But you can assign all kinds of attributes to it in order to look at it and think, oh, okay, we only have 40 spaces here. And if we increase student population by 100%, that's not that frightening, is it? <laughs> what would that do to your parking? We would need, probably need more parking lots, right? Or something, we'd need to accommodate that extra kind of, kind of uh, traffic. Here's another one that sometimes people don't think about. Fire lanes and emergency access. Now, this is not actively being explored, but there are GIS systems out there that are operating where there are interfaces between, let's say, an ASU 
geographic information systems versus an EMS one over the hospital. If a call comes in and it's a room in a building somewhere, what's the best door to go to for the emergency folks? I mean, there are all kinds of applications that can be done that way that can be quite important. Now, the one that's probably really near and dear to us are these things called computers and phones. I tried to make this look fairly simple because when I was looking at all the information, I would have filled up a couple of more slides, the details, uh, and that's over, way over my head. So I just simply brought it down to fiber. Uh, there's a lot of fiber on this campus, isn't there, Otis? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, yeah. And it's really easy to interrupt it. Uh, these things called communication vaults are also very important. This is where all the connections are made. Do you need to know where those things are? Do you need to be able to tell somebody else where those things are? Okay, so is, is anybody kind of confused where we're going with this? I'm just throwing a lot of information at you, right? Giving you kind of a horror story of all these different things that are going on here. Well, here's the beginning of the end, I think, uh, in terms of stuff. There is an awful lot of existing data out there right now. Now, when I say existing data out there right now, what comes to mind, do you think? Maps, maps. And plans, plans, plans. And drawings and drawings and drawings. What kind of volume do you think that takes up? <laughs> this is Jeff. And he's, well, I, di I didn't put what he was thinking on there. Uh, <laughs> and see all these flat files through here? All these big cabinets? Those things are impossibly heavy, uh, but they're full of maps and drawings. All right, now, jump back to our issue that we were talking about earlier with location. And where do you find things? And how do you find things? If somebody walks into that room and says, I want to find the location of a, I don't know, 180 degree sprinkler head, or how many 180 degree sprinkler heads do you have on campus? Uh, what's the option with this system? Well, you could just you know, start going through, go through the sprinkler file and you know, whatever. If you can find one, do you even have one? You know, that's the next question. Is it a collection of information you have to pull off of a number of different landscape plans? Uh, so getting all that stuff is really important. There have been a few people in, on campus uh, who are really enamored with all this stuff, just like me, uh, who have actually started doing some kind of ad hoc things using existing technology and saying, hey, I'm going to try this. And what's really, really neat is that the people who have tried this have been able to give it to us in, in a format where we've been able to incorporate it into a bigger GIS package. And then here's the other part that's really, really exciting. And this is really the thrust of this whole GIS implementation stuff. Uh, getting the data that do not exist. And this is the mobile data collection. This is really cool stuff. So this data collection is key to the idea of mobile computing, for sure, on a number of different things. And this is what we've got now. These are Samsung tablets. You could just as easily use uh, any iOS kind of a system. The key thing is, is to have something called Collector on it. Collector is an Esri product. And what it has is the ability to interface in an online kind of a setting with our uh, online information with the whole campus so that we're able to you know go back and forth between a desktop kind of a setting with stuff in the field uh, this is an example of what these guys can actually work with in the field the right hand side of the screen is a data entry kind of a system where they can tap and start collecting information and there'll be a little dot in the middle which is their location their gps location and so it's possible for these guys to start a little stream, start a line, so to speak, and walk along, and that information will get collected on the tablet, and then when they get to the end of the rope, stop, add information. What kind of information are they gonna put in? Well, I mean, if it's a 13K line, they're probably gonna put in very electrical, <laughs> or something like that, right? They're gonna give us some attribute. Uh, 
Are they going to be able to go back to a desktop situation back in the office when they upload their data and look at it and say, oh, we forgot to say that it's made out of copper <laughs> uh, or something like that. I mean, so this is very, very important stuff. And you see what's happening? People are collecting stuff. They're putting it into a form that will be used later. They're getting that brain trust kind of permanently endowed into the campus. Uh, so, I mean, this is good stuff. And do you think these guys know where everything is? Yeah, but they will soon, right? <laughs> uh, but the important thing is, is that they are collecting data. They're putting it into a system where it can be used later. <sighs> a lot of stuff going on here. Do you think this is easy to do? That's a very optimistic yes. Uh, it can be done. Uh, and one of the problems with uh, the whole ArcGIS program is that it can do an awful lot. The best analogy I have is Microsoft Office. Anybody use Office? Anybody? <laughs> and you guys all know everything that Office can do, right? Like Access. How many people use Access? Ah, blank looks. Uh, how many people use Word? How many people use Mail Merge in Word? See the less number of hands coming up. How many people use Smart Art and PowerPoint? Okay, a few more people. How many people use all the little animations, animations and so forth that happen in various places? Uh, there's a lot to even old Office that we don't ever even use. Probably all of us use five to ten percent of what the system is capable of. This ArcGIS is the same way. But there are some people who have implemented some projects uh, that have not been put off by all this complexity and so forth. Uh, people are taking existing plans, okay, and they're effectively taking that, those ideas and putting them into a more effective and efficient way of recording the data and getting back at it. They're able to ask queries about where things are. Uh, now, are we done yet with those kinds of data entry sorts of things? Hell no. We've got a lot to go on. But uh, there's a lot of neat stuff. Now, there's another one. Unfortunately, the guy who's doing this is not here. Uh, but he's locating trees on campus. And what he's doing is a relatively simple project, walking up to a tree. Here's the tree. Uh, but a tree is a tree is a tree, right? No, trees have sizes, right? Trees have certain levels of health. Trees have certain species characteristics associated with them. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. There are some trees that just look ugly, uh, and they get an ugly check mark, right? <laughs> uh, but I mean, there's all kinds of, all kinds of stuff that you can, you can gather by looking at all these things. Uh, so I mean, these are ones that are actually happening right now. Uh, so, you're probably wondering, when's he actually going to show us something? Maybe this is all just smoke and mirror stuff. Uh, well, this is some data that was collected by Otis. Uh, and Tony, were you involved in that data collection too? I know that Otis is one who swore at me the most about collecting the data, so I'm not going to put that on you. Uh, but he did this, realizing that this was really important to his stuff, to his work. But not knowing quite how to do it, went with what he had, and that's not a criticism, uh, and you know, went with good old Google Earth and started walking around and drawing lines. And all this information is good old Google Earth kind of format. But what's beautiful about this is that this did not go to waste when he came to me and said, what do we do with it? It's possible to put this into ArcGIS. It takes a little bit of tweaking and modification, but the key part is that all the location information is there. Everything's there. Now this is an amalgamation of all the new data that were collected by Tom and Mike, along with Otis's data. Doesn't this look pretty? Oh, you guys are so humoring. Uh, no, this doesn't look very pretty. Is it information? Do all these lines have some significance to them? Yeah. 
they sure have significance. Uh, now, if we were to click on any one of these individual lines or points through here, we would get other information appearing. We would get a window saying, you know, whatever we decided it to be. Uh, what is it, there's sheathing associated with some of the lines and stuff that could be important with locating stuff. You know, the characteristics, like with the sewers, there's the brown, brown pipe, there's cast iron, there's all kinds of stuff uh, that sometimes you need to know about. Another important one is how far down is it? I mean, anybody ever go ice fishing where they think that the uh, ice is only a foot thick and it's about 10 feet thick? <laughs> and your hole gets down to this point and then you catch a fish that's much bigger than the hole and you can't get it out of there? Yeah. Uh, it's important to know what you're dealing with. Now, this is the no background version. Is this particularly useful if you're walking around out in the field with your tablet in front of you with no background? I suppose it could be if you really trust your GPS. What if your uh, GPS fails on you for some reason or you're in a bad place uh, for reception? Well, if you have a Google Earth or an image background like this, uh, it's possible to figure out, oh yeah, I'm right outside of the library. Uh, oh yeah, <gasps> Kevin sees me hiding out in here not doing anything. <laughs> uh, now, a lot of times people think, well, that's not so bad. I mean, how, do we really have that much infrastructure on campus? Um, well, look at all those lines. That's just down here. This is just south campus. This is the old science building. It doesn't have much infrastructure around it, does it? Well, look at all these lines going in and around. Now, here's another important question. Even just knowing this, even if you weren't going to do any digging, Let's say that for some reason or another, James decided he wanted to put in a swimming pool out here. Now, outside of the obvious problem with a swimming pool and digging and water in the San Luis Valley, uh, and you can't swim. Well, it could be your training pool, okay? Your, you know, higher, your continuing education, uh, your laboratory. But for the guys who have to work on these sorts of things, do you really want to put some big, thick structure on top of your lines? Probably not. Uh, I mean, a tennis court out here would be really annoying in the same vein. So this is an example of how you might be able to plan stuff. Uh, are you going to put a parking lot in, in this whole area? There might be demand for it, but look at all the infrastructure. Look, there's a big hub here. And if you need to know any more information about it, see how everything's all labeled right now? This particular thing right here is a vault, I believe. Uh, and this is an important place for connecting things up. If there was a problem somewhere on campus in the fiber, uh, who knows, maybe it was right there. You know, maybe some kid dropped the cherry bomb down that thing in the middle of the night and no one knew. Uh, I'm not saying that that's a good idea or it ever happened, but uh, those are the kinds of things that could, could help us out. Now again, where is this all coming from? A lot of this is existing data, but this is all collected recently. This is not something that got pulled off of a map. This is something that people went out and verified in the field. Okay, so what's gonna happen with the map stuff later? Are all those maps gonna go to waste? No, they're probably gonna get digitized. And there's some people in here who know about digitizing. Uh, basically, it's taking all kinds of information and putting it into a, a spatial kind of a format. Whew, my goodness. So, the progress we've made at this point is I, th I feel like we have a great start. Now, it's almost to the point where, you know, I'm not saying we anymore. I'm saying they have a great start. I'm just the mechanic at this point. And there are a lot of people here who are taking this project and they're driving the car that they're building and designing. Uh, the data have been considerably more integrated at this point, And there's a heck of a lot more communication going on amongst the different sorts of people that are involved in this stuff. Now, this is just facilities and computing services. Uh, so, the next steps that we'll probably end up having to take here, we'll continue to develop. There'll be more expansion of these kinds of ideas into a campus setting, and of course, good old finessing, because we all get it perfect the first time. Uh, there are gonna be lots of opportunities for student internships, because if you think about it, what if we wanted to have somebody go around and just, you know, pick up a number of different 
like sprinkler heads or light poles or you know, students like to hang around in the dark, right? How many students do we see before 8 o'clock in the morning? I was a student once too, I haven't forgotten. Um, illumination from poles. How do you figure out an area that's illuminated by a light pole? Well, you don't do it during the daytime, do you? Nighttime's a little bit better. Hey, we've got students who like to be out at night. You could go out and, you know, you could assign a project to a student, give them a tablet and say, walk the perimeter where you can actually see and that will come up with an area. It might help you evaluate your light types. Uh, so, I mean, there are a number of things that could happen that way. Uh, there's all kinds of potential for more vertical and lateral kinds of relationships in the campus. Okay, now when I say lateral, what am I talking about? What's the one that we've been talking about all day? Facilities and the computing services crowd. Similar sorts of things, similar missions. What would be an example of a more vertical one? Okay, getting into the buildings, you know, thinking spatial and so forth. Yeah, you know, and, and also think about the school mission. You know, the, actually reaching out into the community. Things like your, your hemp project that you talked about. That's reaching out into the community, bigger impact coming back. C student involvement. Uh, you know, you supervisor types, you know, might be able to start you know, pushing things down a little bit too, if you have any good ideas. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to whoever wants to volunteer on this uh, first. But since Scott's looking somewhat ashen, uh, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let Kevin go first. Do you want to add anything to this? I think the conversation started with all of us it was um, the 811 calls and every time we stuck a pole in the ground we had to call seven different municipalities to come out and, and locate that's not being a very good neighbor so we need to do banners we need to do this we need to do that but I believe the number that sticks in my head was like 138 811 calls one month and we don't have the resources and facilities to just drop what we're doing or computing services to go out and locate. So we put our heads together on, okay, well let's maybe we can create spaces on campus that we locate one one time, we pour a concrete pad, and now every time you locate you get ten different spots. And then Rob and Otis work together to map it out on a map for our customers. So that's where we started and then we got together and, and collaborated and the idea just blew up and here, here we are, I can't believe we're here. And it's pretty neat to, and on the facility side, it's asset management. Everything that, all the infrastructure is an asset and Mike changes all the lamps and that was a good example, but we have so many different lamps and we don't have the space at facilities to stock all of these different lamps. So how can we get a standard, you know, standardization is one of them. So there's just a lot of things, rooftop units, when do they get maintained? What bell sizes are they? Instead of having Tom go up to the top of the rec stadium and figure out what belt we need and then order it, you know, let's have an inventory and let's order that same standard belt and let's have a preventative maintenance schedule where we don't wait for it to break. And I think that's where we're at. Yeah, you guys. Well, they're, they're, they're coming up because I'm about to uh, 
acknowledge those guys right this second. Uh, I'd like these guys to stand up and be recognized for what they're doing. Mike, you've got to stand up. Tom, you've got to stand up. Jeff, Otis, you've got to stand up too. Come on, Otis. And then Edgar, Edgar's, Edgar's not here, but uh, he's, one of, he's one of our biology students. He's a GIS guy. He's been working with the uh, Colorado State Forest guys. Is that right? With Adam Moore yeah. and that crowd, uh, you know, doing the tree inventory. So at this point, now that you know who they are, and Otis is sitting down, uh, <laughs> but uh, there are all kinds of different questions here. You can ask me about, you know, how do you write the program? So I'll say, I don't know. Uh, but if you have any specific questions about, you know, the different sorts of impl implementations, you know, please ask right now. We've got all these little specialists here. Dr. Jones. <laughs> back to one of the very first things he talked about, retirement. A lot of knowledge at this institution is contained in people's brains, and it's not well documented what goes on. Uh, through my close to 20 years here, Jeff and I have gone out on many occasions and worked together to identify his electrical lines, my communication lines out there. So <clears throat> based upon Scott's aggravation with having to go do all these locates, Working with Tony and other people, I sat down and I used Google Earth because it's in my head. In Google Earth, I could zoom in, I could locate my communication vault. Through the years of experience here, I was able to build this map. So I could send that map out to other people. If you gave me a file, here, you want to see where these lines are at? Here you go. That's good for planning purposes. We built on this institution East Campus. That had to be connected to this institution. We've added a migrant workers house out here. That has to be connected. Uh, we just did a new addition to the gingerbread house down here. <clears throat> All these things have to connect, and how do we look at that? How do we plan that? There's a, there's a committee going on right now looking at the institution as a whole, where we're gonna build new things, where we're gonna tear down things. How do we service that? <coughs> so it just kind of grew out of the frustration of having to run out there all the time, mm -hmm. having reinvent this information and we started out with that. Kevin brought up the idea, well you're gonna retire here one of these days, what are you gonna do with this information? I said, it's gonna go with me. You know, it's like most everybody else that leaves here. <coughs> That's what I told him, I said, I've already got this documented, Kevin, and here it is. We took a look at that and decided to expand upon that with bringing facility services in because we're partners in a lot of things we do out there. And through this experience of our knowledge of documenting it, people will know about the old foundation that used to go run around the campus. They'll know about certain uh, unique areas on this campus that when we're digging, uh, we, we discover things all the time. So this is something that's gonna continue on. It's a never ending process. But uh, with 911 locates that we have to do on this campus, the uh, state of Colorado uh, had a committee investigate this and found out that we're far behind on accountability on this. So in the world of 911 and damage to our infrastructure, they're talking fines in the hundreds of millions of dollars now for people to break the wire lines or people to don't locate them correctly. One example, he showed that uh, in the slide of the people down in the hole with fiber optics. There was a fiber optics line busted up in their Colorado Springs, $1 million an hour. $1 million an hour downtime. So we have that, we have plenty. Yeah, that we was NORAD lines, that was financial lines, all sorts of stuff run through that fiber optics. If people remember here several years back, we had a line cut up on the Vita Pass. The valley went dark. There was no buying, no gas, no ATMs. There was nothing. One cut. It's very, very important that we as an institution recognize where our infrastructure is that you don't see. It's underground. Uh, we had a lady that wanted to donate trees to the college. Went out here, stuck a shovel in the ground, cut one of my lines, flicker and snot. Oops, uh, yeah. That's well, why you don't just go out and stick a flagpole in the ground around here. Some of the stuff is literally inches below, some is many feet below ground. So I won't we, take up too much of your time. Yeah, I mean, kind of where yeah. it's at. you think the money, just the money alone. 
Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I guess I was one of the, looking at it from a physical perspective. You know, where do you know, or how do you know where to start? And then go. That it's not based on the map within the cabinets there. Well, we, mm -hmm. we don't. We've got to. Um, I noticed uh, too. They've got to, most of their fiber also has copper wire for, for their data. Okay. And we've got locators that you hook on. And hook on to onto what? the to the oh. copper. And you start walking. I can I can okay. trace uh, our electrical because it's copper or metal. <coughs> um, where we have columns is sewer where we do not have uh, wires with it. Everything else we're having put in, we run a copper tracer wire, such as with gas or tape, so that you can trace this out. Uh, yeah. Water okay. is all your plastic. So that's how we find it, right? Yeah. But it starts with blueprints. Mm -hmm. So I think what right. you're saying is where do you where do you start? You start in that room where Jeff was and you dig through and then you have what you call a gas drill. Well we we since nineteen forty we've been we've been on that property with it to sprinkler line fifteen times. So hopefully we That's a whole other layer that uh, is in consideration. Some of it, like I said, there's a lot of things to, to begin with. And if you take an ArcGIS, you know that there's a ton of potential with this program. I'm a, I'm a simple telephone technician. Halfway through the class when we did the three-eyed purple frog exercise <laughs> and it showed the different zones and how one area impacted another, I said, you know, this is Snails. Good. It works. Yeah, this, this could be student data, this could be lighting exercise. There's so many things that can come together in this. You could get overwhelmed. As anybody that's taken the class will probably attest to. Uh, there's just so much things that you can do with it. We don't want to go there. We don't want to get overwhelmed. We don't want to, to lose track of where we're going. And to make this exercise work, we have to have a good, solid foundation of anything you're building. Building a house, you want that solid foundation to build on. And this is where we're starting from. This is our learning curve here. This is our exercise in, in banging the head against the wall going, that was really stupid, Rob. Why in the hell did we do that? <laughs> and then turn around and say, you know, God, that was a great idea. I'm glad we caught that. So yeah. this, this is the very infantile stage of this process. And, you know, it's not like infantile, like we're behaving like babies per se, but it's very early on. Yeah, well, yeah. And the potential is, the potential is huge. Other questions? Gosh, you guys are all being cowardly. <laughs> Sorry, Logan, go ahead. Two slides to uh, your campus map with uh, various lines drawn. This one? Sure, that one's great. Or do you want the next one with nothing? What, what are the actual lines represented? Because frankly, well, I would expect a tremendous more, amount more data than that. Well, part, part of it's visual. Uh, I could put a lot of data up there, and I would violate all the rules of PowerPoint, uh, <laughs> uh, if you catch my drift. Now, if I was doing a live demo on this right now, uh, I could click on one of these and a table would come up. Or I could run a query saying, show me all the lines that are 13,000 volts, and they would get highlighted. Uh, show me all the uh, volts that have more than five connections in them, for instance, and they would get highlighted. That's the query part. Sure. Now, this is just, your, your question's right on. There's not much data up here other than just showing locations and a few names. But there's a lot more in there. An example is the sewer line right now. We have a major sewer problem on Faculty Drive. And for that has nothing to do with faculty, by the way, just for the record. <laughs> do we keep Faculty Drive or we, do we dump thousands of dollars into this aged sewer line that continues to back up and we don't know when it's going to fail? We know it's failed. Right now, we know that there's spots that are broken, disconnected. It needs work, but how do you weigh that? You know, so an attribute. If we clicked on that, it would say 50 years old clay pipe. And you can add any information that you would like to add to that as well. With the attribute table, it's just like a huge Excel spreadsheet. I mean, you can add anything that you would like to add to that information wise. So that's where we just started off with this linear information. And we're working with Rob to develop what those fields are so that you can click that and find out. Kimberly, at this level, red lines are electrical, <coughs> electrical, 
yellow, you've got Orange, high voltage, yes. lighting. Okay. And, and a lot of stuff isn't on there right now, such as your water and your sewer. Uh, right, yeah. This is pretty, is pretty endless. I mean, we had talked in some of our conversations about, okay, now this is looking top down. Think about a building as you look up. Where are wireless access points, for instance? Where is the cabling and all the infrastructure inside a building? And inventory, and okay, now we need to do a remodel. How much is that going to cost? And so there's a lot of implications on a business side of things as well that this information really will help feed. And, and, and in conclusion here, uh, I think the thing that really, really is important to me is that a lot of people have come together on this, and a lot of people have brought in their perspective on things. And this has the ability to involve students from relatively small projects, students in bigger projects, all the way up into long-term things that will make a difference for the school, particularly in the uh, area of leveraging the resources that we have. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, then I think there's more pizza. And thank you very much for coming, everybody. <laughs>